The past, I think the subject is of huge public importance. The past 12 months have been, without a doubt, I think the most exciting year in history in, the terms, of, in terms of disclosure of information. Um, we've had WikiLeaks disclosures, the largest, largest leak in journalistic history in Cablegate, and of course the significant disclosures in the collateral murder video, the Iraq and Afghanistan war logs prior to that. We've also seen widespread illegal phone hacking come to light, um, phone hacking engaged in by Murdoch's News of the World in London, the phenomena of super injunctions and the interplay of privacy super injunctions in social media and in the modern media world. The events of the past year and the fact that it's been at the top of the international headlines, it's a year that I would call the year of dangerous disclosures. But it's thrown into sharp relief questions about legal regimes related to the disclosure of information, protections relating to free speech, freedom of the press, the protection of privacy of individuals, the protection for sources and for whistleblowers, the alleged need for confidentiality in government, and the justification for the concomitant limitations upon freedom of information and transparency through our freedom of information laws. This morning I'm going to focus though on the WikiLeaks disclosures and political and legal responses to those disclosures towards WikiLeaks and to its editor-in-chief, Julian Assange. <coughs> WikiLeaks has played an incredible role in bringing these issues to the forefront of human debate. I will explain today how, faced with the challenges of what disclosure of information means in this modern media age, working under an even uh, the sorry the conflicted responses of some Australian leaders, working under an even less sustainable approach from the US towards what WikiLeaks has done. The fact that that reinforces the need to maintain a long-term vision about the role of law and indeed the rule of law in ensuring integrity and transparency in government and in the regulation of disclosure of information in the public interest. The rush to silence WikiLeaks that we saw in the past 12 months relies on the abandonment, I say, of any sustainable legal standard. We heard this morning about Obama's presentation to Australian Parliament yesterday and his insistence that free speech applies to all. What I'm going to tell you today is that free speech applies to all, perhaps except WikiLeaks and Julian Assange. This has grave implications for the rest of the media and I think it's a point that's been lost and one that hasn't been taken up forcefully enough in my view by more traditional news organisations. Because the way in which WikiLeaks has been, has been approached, the approach to legality of disclosures uh, and the conduct of WikiLeaks, I think has great implications for the rest of the media. <coughs> the precedent action is to be applied consistently for the same conduct of other news organisations. So what I'm going to talk to you about today is inconsistent approaches and how unsustainable they are and the broader implications they have for news organisations. Importantly, to the application and definitions of the law on disclosure of information. This is most obviously evidenced by the attempts to create specific exemptions uh, with respect to disclosures for WikiLeaks. For example, in the US, we saw attempts to exclude WikiLeaks specifically from the introduction of the Federal Shield Law. The treatment of WikiLeaks, I say, creates a dangerous precedent and a slippery slope for all news organisations. Media organisations and their legal counsel ought to see their own self-interest in standing together with WikiLeaks in defending freedom of speech and public interest disclosures and pushing for better, better protections under the law. But in an era of change in the media, it's important too that Australia remains focused and must hold their nerve in following through their recognition of the importance of putting in place public interest disclosure legislation and that which it's committed to. In the time allotted today, unfortunately, I can't get too much into the law, and we have a number of specialised experts here who are far better qualified than I to speak about those subjects. But my intention is to talk about WikiLeaks, give you some anecdotes of my own personal experience in dealing with this case and the way in which it's been treated. Um, and in particular, two specific disclosures, which were actually not disclosures by WikiLeaks, to highlight some important legal issues and hopefully spur further discussion and debate today. The title of the the conference actually balancing private interests and pub, pub, the public interest and private interests is interesting and I think it begs the discussion of privacy um, and the current debate both here and in the UK about the development of the law of privacy. 
I do actually have practical experience in dealing with privacy cases and in particular super injunction cases and I hope that that's a subject of matter of discussion today. But unfortunately I cannot speak to you at all about any of the cases that I've worked on. I don't know if any of you are familiar with super injunctions but basically it means that I cannot tell you about the subject matter that the injunction related to. I cannot tell you about my client and the identity of my client or the claimants in a particular case nor can I tell you about the existence of the order and the proceedings in question. I do hope that that's a subject of legal debate today because I often thought when I was sitting in the, in the corridors of the Royal Courts of Justice and the press were kicked out of our courtroom and there were these signs up the front with X, B, Y. I thought to myself, in terms of legal history, how will we look back upon this time? And I hope that that's something that those discussing privacy today will discuss. But today, my mantle, I guess, is WikiLeaks. First, I want to talk about the remarkable achievement that Assange has achieved through WikiLeaks, the greatest, the largest legal journalist in history. Laurie Oates, a veteran Australian political journalist, says, leaks are the difference between a democracy and an authoritarian society. The risk of being found out by leaks makes those in authority think twice about telling porkies, performing their duties sloppily, behaving badly, or rorting the system. The way in which WikiLeaks has developed a safe and anonymous way of delivering leaks, both to the media and to the general public, I think has made a remarkable contribution both to the practice of journalism and to the operation of democracy. Leaking itself is best described as the unauthorised disclosure of inside information. Public interest disclosure legislation is that which recognises and grants a higher authority for disclosures that would otherwise be unlawful or actionable. One might argue that not all leaking is whistleblowing and not all whistleblowing necessarily involves leaking, but I think the two come together in what, Wikile what the WikiLeaks organisation describes as its purpose, which is principled leaking. And that is for the purpose of holding to account government and business. But what's so revolutionary about what, what WikiLeaks has done? First, I say it's providing through technology rather than the law protection for sources and journalists, the human rights of both sources and the journalists, by providing an anonymous drop box which, makes it un it, which is untraceable, which means that the identity of sources are protected. This provides protection, or may provide protection, against prosecutions for unauthorised disclosures where public interest disclosure does not yet protect that disclosure. Second, WikiLeaks has made available more information than ever before. And I don't mean necessarily just in terms of the size of the leaks. Cablegate is, of course, the largest leak of confidential information in history. But I think what's important about what WikiLeaks has done is making it available to a huge range of journalists the world over, rather than that one journalist in Canberra or in Washington receiving leaked documents from a government official. WikiLeaks has made it available to journalists around the world, those that are best able to put it in context. They've worked with 90 media organisations from the Hindu in India to Liberté in Haiti. And those journalists that would never otherwise have had access to this information now have access to information that they would never have otherwise got. And it's information that journalists, even with their best intentions working in the field, may not have had access to. If a journalist is excluded from a state, they're unable to get the information, but we have these WikiLeaks diplomatic cables that provide us with an insight that diplomats have that journalists would not otherwise have had. Finally, I think that we also have to recognise that the public interest in the nature of the disclosures that we saw, through, particularly through Cable Bay, from Tunisia to Tonga, from the West Bank to West Papua, WikiLeaks disclosures have provided an unprecedented insight into the operation of diplomacy and revealed corruption and human rights abuse the world over. To cite just some examples, we learned that the US was spying on UN diplomats in New York in breach of its international obligations under treaty to provide protection to the UN in its offices in New York. Australian diplomats would have been among those targeted. We learned that King Abdullah of Saudi Arabia asked the US to attack Iran, while officials in Jordan and Bahrain want Iran's nuclear program stopped by any means available. We learned that Britain's Iraq inquiry was fixed to protect US interests. We learned that Sweden is a covert member of NATO and US intelligence sharing is kept from Parliament and from the Swedish people. We learned that the US is playing hardball in trying to get rid of Guantanamo Bay inmates and is putting pressure on foreign states to take those that have been released from Guantanamo. 
Our Pacific neighbour Kiribati was offered millions, a million actually, per prisoner to take them from Guantanamo, so they're not, no longer the US's problem. We also learned that the US reinstituted military ties with in Indonesia despite ongoing human rights abuse in West Park, a workplace that's very dear to my heart. Despite the fact that they knew that human rights abuse were ongoing, and despite the fact that was the, that was the actual reason for the ban in the first place, that ban was lifted as a result of President Giuliano's uh, threat to cancel Obama's official visit, and so Obama capitulated and reinstituted military ties despite ongoing human rights abuse. All of this said, the disclosures that I'm going to highlight today in making my point about the absence of the rule of law and the way in which the US and the Australian government has approached WikiLeaks and the disclosure of that information are actually two disclosures that didn't come from WikiLeaks and they have implications both for WikiLeaks and for me personally. The first is, hopefully you'll have copies on your table, is a copy of a letter, is the letter, written from Harold Cove from the US State Department, addressed to me Dear Ms. Robinson and Mr. Assange, in breach of my rights, under the UN Basic Principles on the Role of Advocates, um, this was a letter that was written in response to a letter that I communicated to the US Ambassador in London on behalf of Julian in advance of the WikiLeaks disclosures in December, on the Friday, 26th of November. The second, I'll go into that a little bit further. But this, this letter really sets the tone and the basis for which the allegations of illegality against WikiLeaks. It is also formed the basis for the financial blockade that is ongoing and threatens to basically <coughs> shut down and use economic means of censorship to prevent WikiLeaks continuing to publish. The second that I'll refer to, and I'll come back to this, is a document entitled The WikiLeaks Threat by H.B. Gary. Has anybody heard of that? This was a document prepared by US government contractors at the behest of Bank of America working together with a law firm in Washington. And it was designed as an attack on WikiLeaks, setting out its strategy as private corporations to smear, undermine, and otherwise attack the organization, including numerous individuals, myself included. Both of these disclosures have incredibly important incredibly important implications regarding the privatisation of extra legal activities and attacks on both whistleblowers um, and activists more generally. Um, these are activities conducted at the behest of government but implemented by private corporations, sometimes on taxpayers' funds, to undermine and sweep Wiki WikiLeaks and individuals associated which are, who are all in various ways working to facilitate public interest disclosures. Both of them, I'll explain, highlight the way the different category that WikiLeaks has placed compared to other media organisations. But first of all, the letter from Hal Coe. As WikiLeaks was about to publish the diplomatic cables, there was a lot of concern about risk to national security and risk to life, and the US government knew the cables were coming and were briefing foreign governments and human rights NGOs the world over, saying, this is terrible, this is going to cause it. This is going to undermine international relations the world over. Our national security is a grave risk. So Julian was off in somewhere in the UK. I had no idea where. I only communicated with him by encrypted chat. And he chatted, he got online one day and said to me, Jen, I need you to communicate this letter to the, to the US ambassador. The purpose of the letter was to identify and take measures to prevent any identified circumstances that the US government would say with specific particularity of incidences within the cables that would really threaten national security, really threaten human lives. Now, putting on a blank piece of paper, Dear Ambassador Sussman from Julian Assange, you can post that over to the ambassador and you might not think it's going to get the attention that it deserves. So I put a little cover note on it, signed off on it, please see attached confidential correspondence from our client, and signed my name. Popped it off, printed it off, no signature from Julian, sent it over to the ambassador's residence. I had a phone call later that afternoon from the US ambassador um, informing that it mean that he'd received the correspondence and he would be getting back to me as soon as possible. The next evening, on the way home from a, a, a wedding, having had a few too many glasses of champagne, <laughs> An email popped up on my BlackBerry from Harold Coe, and I thought, wow, legal advice to the State Department, that's going to be important. 
In that email came this letter. Now this letter is incredibly important, and I'll read you the relevant text. Dear Ms. Robinson and Mr. Assange, I'm writing in response to your 26 November letter, um, and in, regarding your intention to again publish on your WikiLeaks site what you claim to be classified US government documents. As you know, if any of the materials you intend to publish were provided by any government officials or any intermediary, intermediary without proper authorization, they were provided in violation of US law and without regard for the grave consequences of this action. As long as WikiLeaks holds such material, the violation of law is ongoing. By this letter, the US government did two things. The first, which had personal implications for me. This letter was then leaked to Reuters the very next day, at a time when Julian was subjected to assassination threats, calls for his extrajudicial killing, um, and this was published on the internet, Dear Ms. Robinson and Mr. Assange. For my own personal reasons, um, lawyers, defence groups the world over took this up, because basically, the language of this letter and the way in which it's drafted presents me as a joint, as this is a joint enterprise between myself and my client. Um, that in and of itself was seen by lawyers groups the world over as um, extra legal pressure upon not just WikiLeaks, but its legal advisors associated with the cables. But more importantly, this has consequences for WikiLeaks. What this letter did was to intentionally imply that what WikiLeaks was doing in the publication of the cables was illegal. If you look at the terms of the letter, and I encourage you to have a closer look, they don't say, it doesn't say specifically that WikiLeaks in the publication of the cables acts illegally, because we know from the Pentagon Papers in the US that that's a legally indefensible position to take. The publication of material received from sources is protected by the First Amendment. What they're saying, they are implying that someone has breached the law, i.e. the source who has made the disclosure. But they imply in this letter by not being clear with the language that WikiLeaks is somehow implicated in that illegal act. Now, this has had major public practical importance for WikiLeaks. First, in the dialogue around the ways in which WikiLeaks has been treated and the way in which it's been or sought to have been distinguished from news organisations who also publish the material. Remember, WikiLeaks had five international partners, later expanded to 90, all of whom also published these cables. The Guardian, the New York Times, De Spiegel, Le Monde, and I forget one. The publication was legal, but the point that they're trying to make is that somehow WikiLeaks, by receiving information, has somehow solicited or encouraged sources to breach law. All news organisations ought to be wary of this. What WikiLeaks does is create an anonymous Dropbox. There is little, if any, communication with any of the sources. They simply receive material. It is the modern day equivalent of receiving a brown paper envelope on your desk. Any journalist will tell you, any journalist who works in investigative journalism will tell you that more often than not, journalists and traditional news organisations have a far closer relationship with the source in question who gives them the documents. They'll take them for a beer at the pub, they'll go for a coffee, and there's often quite a long conversation about the importance of the documents, and they do actually actively encourage sources to hand over that information. If what WikiLeaks does by creating an anonymous Dropbox to simply receive the information somehow implicates them in soliciting that information from government sources, then we are in a very, very dangerous situation. But this is the basis upon which the US State Department acted, and it actually has had greater implications. The financial blockade which started just days after this, you can imagine Acting for Julian, it was an incredibly busy time. We had dealing with this correspondence from the US State Department. The cables started being published on the 28th of November, which was the following day. His arrest warrant came, was, became live on the 3rd of December and was communicated on the 6th, which meant we were in the police station on the 7th. 
This is while publication of Kevin Pate's going on. WikiLeaks is working madly with its media partners to redact and publish the material in accordance with timetables that we've negotiated. It was an incredibly busy time. Alongside of that, you have PayPal, MasterCard, Visa, both freezing Julian's own personal bank accounts um, and refusing to take any payments for WikiLeaks. The basis upon which they acted is this letter. PayPal first said, well, we are cutting off payments because we've had a letter from the State Department telling us that WikiLeaks is acting illegally. The State Department then said, well, we sent no such letter, we haven't communicated with PayPal. <laughs> it later turned out that they'd acted on the basis of this letter, which had been published, it had been leaked by the State Department to Reuters and published all over the internet, which we have no problem with, obviously. I mean, when you're advising WikiLeaks, you can hardly object to <laughs> the leaking and publication of the document. Okay. Um, in fact, I think it serves WikiLeaks purposes. But that was the basis upon which PayPal cancelled all payments because they say in breach of user services terms. They say that WikiLeaks, by creating this anonymous Dropbox, encourages illegal activity and therefore is in breach of its user policies and they will refuse to make payments. Very soon thereafter, Visa, MasterCard did exactly the same thing, cutting off 95% of WikiLeaks revenue. Essentially what that does is achieve what the US government cannot because of constitutional protections under the First Amendment. Private corporations, by implementing these financial bans, are in effect wiping out an organisation through economic censorship. Or imagine if Fairfax was subjected to a financial and banking blockade because one of its journalists encouraged a source over a beer down at the pub to hand over some confidential information. This is the precedent that is being set by actions with respect to WikiLeaks, and I think it's time that we acknowledge what this means for the rule of law, and in particular, for, reg for journalism and the regulation of the disclosure of information. Because what Wiki while WikiLeaks has introduced, I think, a revolution in disclosure of information, what they do, while on a larger scale, is no different to what journalists have always done. At its core, the act of publication of information disclosed to the public interest is no different it's just on a much greater, scale, much greater scale, perhaps with greater technological sophistication. But at the same time, WikiLeaks' high impact strategy has caused controversy and has really led to, I think it's been a game changer in considering journalism. And it's become a byword for the debate about the nature of journalism and the role of journalists. But as I said before, this rush to silence WikiLeaks relies on the abandonment of any sustainable legal standard. Julia Gillard came out in the days after the code letter was published saying Assange had to be stopped because he had broken the law. This was pre prejudicial, of course, premature, and proven as such by an Australian Federal Police investigation. Also off the back of this letter that you have in front of you, McClellan threatened to uh, cancel Julian's passport, and I'll never forget that day. I was actually sitting in an office with Julian the day that news hit the, day that hit the news, and he said to me, Ten, you will not believe it, they're going to cancel my passport. Maybe we should look into me applying for refugee status. Oh. And I thought, what? where have we come to? This is not my country. This is not my country. I didn't believe him. I actually had to, he had to show me the computer screen. So I said, no, you've got to be joking. You've got to be joking. If the government had maintained that line against WikiLeaks, Julian would have been the first ever, the first ever, political refugee seeking refuge from Australia rather than coming to Australia. As Malcolm Turbull very correctly pointed out, the Australian government response was like a sequel to UK's response to spy a years ago. Gillard did what he called a Thatcher on WikiLeaks. Not only was it perfectly obvious that Assange had broken no Australian law, and despite the strenuous efforts of the American authorities, there's still no evidence to date that he has broken any American laws. But the decision of the High Court spy catcher made it quite clear that any action in an Australian court to restrain Assange from publishing the State Department cables would have failed. As set out before the spy catcher litigation and in Commonwealth and Fairfax, uh, in Commonwealth and Fairfax, the High Court was very clear in declaring that an Australian court should not, and I quote, 
act to protect the intelligence secrets and confidential political information of the foreign government, even one which was a friendly one and even in circumstances where the Australian government was requested to do so. But let's consider more carefully the imputation of incorrect, uh, the in incorrect imputation of illegality. It is clear WikiLeaks has not acted illegally in publishing the information. The basis upon which it's thought is participation in the illegal release of information itself, that is, in the act of whistleblowing. But in so doing, there's a new attempt to impose a new and different standard on the conduct of new media, which has frightening implications for the old media. In August 2010, WikiLeaks activities were described by the Pentagon as brazen solicitation to US government officials to break the law. Subsequent statements have suggested that the government may seek to make a case that solicitation of material through the provision of an anonymous dropbox amounts to the unlawful unbelief, such as to render the solicitor, not me, Julian, complicit in the offence. As I said before, any investigative journalist would tell you that that puts at risk everything that they do and what they do on a daily basis. The standard, if that is allowed to stand, is one that I don't think can realistically be imposed on any other media organisation, at least not in any nation claiming to have a free media and a commitment to democracy. Certainly not in Australia, as the Supreme Court has made clear, and I'd like to think certainly not in the US. <coughs> but this debate leads on to important discussion of law reform and protections for those who do release information that is provided to WikiLeaks or other media or publishing organisations, leaving aside the question of solicitation those who are responsible for giving over the information in the first place. The inconsistency in approach to WikiLeaks caused major problems for the introduction of shield laws in the US. Given the uncertainty continuing to surround the protection of whistleblowers, the availability of legal privilege, entitling journalists to refuse to reveal the identity of sources, is obviously of importance in protecting those involved in public interest disclosure of information. However, unfortunately, at least in the US, happily for us it didn't happen here, Political disapproval of WikiLeaks in the US has seen a concerted effort to recategorise WikiLeaks as something other than a publisher of news or uh, acting in journalism. Despite the fact WikiLeaks is plainly a publisher of news and is entitled to shield protection under Australian federal law, the US knee joke reaction was that WikiLeaks should not be eligible to, to claim the reporter's privilege flowing to investigative journalists under the First Amendment. This reaction to WikiLeaks is credited with the failure of the US long awaited federal shield laws in January 2011. Unlike Australian shield laws, the definitions provided in that draft bill excluded purely volunteer, part time, or recreational web publishers in favour of persons who regularly participate in news publishing for a substantial period of time for substantial financial gain. That would clearly exclude WikiLeaks and any of its volunteers if they were to disclose or receive information. They would not be able to claim benefit of the journalistic privilege in the US if that law were to be passed. But to make doubly sure that they wouldn't be able to uh, benefit from it, uh, US congressmen reportedly prepared an amendment to the bill which would explicitly exclude WikiLeaks from protections under the Act before passed. Happily, in Australia, while our federal shield laws are far from perfect, the implementation in the last year or so has provided a, better, a, a greater protection for journalists in this country. And also very happily, the definition of journalism and news medium under that Act is broad enough to cover participate, the participants in news gathering and publication in the age of new media, including WikiLeaks. So on that, Australia has done much better than the US. But the singling out of WikiLeaks as a web publisher was not limited to its characterisations for the purposes of shield laws, but also extended to allegations that WikiLeaks had somehow participated in the solicitation of disclosure itself, that is, the act of whistleblowing. The debate has certainly focused attention on whistleblowing protections and their inadequacies, um, particularly given the plight of Bradley Manning, the alleged source for WikiLeaks in the US. I think it's telling that the anniversary conference of Whistleblowing Australia that's being held this weekend, I don't know if anybody here is also attending that, is called Whistleblowers Still Living Dangerously 20 Years On. And in response to WikiLeaks, Assange Money is anything to go by, this title is incredibly appropriate. 
While Australia's made some headway in implementing certain whistleblowing protections, most notably in Queensland, which has arguably one of the most progressive whistleblowing protection laws in the world, these haven't gone far enough. Notably, almost four years since the federal government committed to enact a Federal Public Interest Disclosure Act, a further self-imposed deadline of 30th of June 2011 has passed without any major progress. Further, the Australian government has made only marginal progress towards comprehensive whistleblower protection in Australia's business and non-government sectors, for example. If the HB Gary controversy, the private contractor document that was released to WikiLeaks earlier this year, is anything to go by, it can only prove the importance of extending whistleblowing into these fields to ensure that information that, in that case, released by Anonymous, which allowed me to know that there was a speed campaign on foot against me individually as Julian Alexander's lawyer, would be protected. Finally, if I have time, I'd like to make a few remarks about freedom of information and the exemptions that apply what we also saw in the WikiLeaks disclosures, as we know under freedom of information laws, we have the right to access certain information subject to certain exemptions. What was published by WikiLeaks would never have been made available under normal procedures through freedom of information. It would have been excluded on the basis of a national security exemption or one about the impact upon international relations. Again, the inconsistent approaches by the US government in their responses to those disclosures, I think, must make us ask questions about the sorts of information that's being denied to us under freedom of information laws. Initially, prior to the publication of Cablegate, the US government was screening blue murder about the impact on national security as a result of those disclosures. It was not long thereafter that Robert Gates admitted publicly that in fact it hadn't caused adverse, significant adverse damage to America's national interests or its international relations. It had been a mere embarrassment. A mere embarrassment. What does that mean for the application of exemptions in freedom of information? I do a lot of freedom of information work in the UK and I'm constantly tussling with government departments. National security as a term is nebulous and one of my most hated in any context in the legal profession working with journalists. And it's invariably the case that when you have objective judges considering the material and considering what ought to be disclosed, the outcomes are very different. For example, we acted in a case called Binya Muhammad, which was about the use of torture and the UK's knowledge of the use of torture against British res residents in Guantanamo Bay and elsewhere around the world. In that case, the Foreign Secretary certified that they could not release the information about that use of torture because it would undermine its intelligence relationship with the US. We intervened on behalf of a group of media organisations to challenge that notion. We introduced expert evidence which stated that it in fact, from a former diplomat and intelligence official within the UK government, saying that, in fact, it would not harm that relationship. And when it was put before a judge, he, he agreed with us and that information was released. I think that the, the approach taken to national security and international relations exemptions under freedom of information needs to be re-examined in light of what we've seen through Cablegate. Those disclosures, very important, huge public interest, and as Robert Gates said, were merely embarrassing and didn't unduly affect national, national security. With that, I think I'll leave us some time for questions. But in conclusion, I think it's appropriate that at a conference on the rule of law that we talk about the absence of the rule of law in the way in which disclosure of information by WikiLeaks has been approached, both by the US government and our own government. This rush to silence WikiLeaks, as I've said, I think relies on an abandonment of any sustainable legal standard and a real inconsistency in the way that WikiLeaks and other news organisations are being approached. In the Pentagon Papers case, the US Supreme Court said, only a free and unrestrained press can effectively expose deception in government. The swirling storm around WikiLeaks today, I think, reinforces the need to defend the right of all media, both new and old, to reveal the truth. Thank you. Laws, but also extended to allegations that WikiLeaks is somehow 
participated in the solicitation of disclosure itself, that is the act of whistleblowing. The debate has certainly focused attention on whistleblowing protections and their inadequacies, um, particularly given the plight of Bradley Manning, the alleged source for WikiLeaks in the US. I think it's telling that the anniversary conference of Whistleblowing Australia that's being held this weekend, I don't know if anybody here is also attending that, is called Whistleblowers Still Living Dangerously 20 Years On. And in response to WikiLeaks, Assange Manning is anything to go by, this title is incredibly appropriate. While Australia has made some headway in implementing certain whistleblowing protections, most notably in Queensland, which has arguably one of the most progressive whistleblowing protection laws in the world, these haven't gone far enough. Notably, almost four years since the federal government committed to enact a Federal Public Interest Disclosure Act, a further self-imposed deadline of 30th of June 2011 has passed without any major progress. Further, the Australian Government has made only marginal progress towards comprehensive whistleblower protection in Australia's business and non-government sectors, for example. If the H.B. Gary controversy, the private contractor document that was released to WikiLeaks earlier this year, is anything to go by, it can only prove the importance of extending whistleblowing into these fields to ensure that information that, in that case, released by Anonymous which allowed me to know that there was a speed campaign on foot against me individually as Julian Alexander's lawyer, would be protected. Finally, if I have time, I'd like to make a few remarks about freedom of information and the exemptions that apply. What we also saw in the WikiLeaks disclosures. As we know under the Freedom of Information Laws, we have the right to access certain information subject to certain exemptions. What was published by WikiLeaks would never have been made available under normal procedures through Freedom of Information. It would have been excluded on the basis of a national security exemption or one about the impact upon international relations. Again, the inconsistent approaches by the US government in their responses to those disclosures, I think, must make us ask questions about the sorts of information that's being denied to us under freedom of information laws. Initially, prior to the publication of Papergate, the US government was screening blue murder about the impact on national security as a result of those disclosures. It was not long thereafter that Robert Gates admitted publicly that in fact it hadn't caused adverse, significant adverse damage to America's national interests or its international relations, it had been a mere embarrassment. A mere embarrassment. What does that mean for the application of exemptions in freedom of information? I do a lot of freedom of information work in the UK and I'm constantly tussling with government departments. National security as a term is nebulous and one of my most hated in any context in the legal profession working with journalists. And it's invariably the case that when you have objective judges considering the material and considering what ought to be disclosed, the outcomes are very different. For example, we acted in a case called Binya Muhammad, which was about the use of torture and the UK's knowledge of the use of torture against British res residents in Guantanamo Bay and elsewhere around the world. In that case, the Foreign Secretary certified that they could not release the information about that use of torture because it would undermine its intelligence relationship with the US. We intervened on behalf of a group of media organisations to challenge that notion. We introduced expert evidence which stated that it in fact, from a former diplomat and intelligence official within the UK government, saying that, in fact, it would not harm that relationship. And when it was put before a judge, he, he agreed with us and that information was released. I think that the, the approach taken to national security and international relations exemptions under freedom of information needs to be re-examined in light of what we've seen through Cablegate. Those disclosures, very important, huge public interest, and as Robert Gates said, were merely embarrassing and didn't unduly affect national, national security. With that, I think I'll leave us some time for questions. But in conclusion, I think it's appropriate that at a conference on the rule of law that we talk about the absence of the rule of law in the way in which disclosure of information by WikiLeaks has been approached. 
both by the US government and our own government. This rush to silence WikiLeaks, as I've said, I think relies on an abandonment of any sustainable legal standard and a real inconsistency in the way that WikiLeaks and other news organisations are being approached. In the Pentagon Papers case, the US Supreme Court said, only a free and unrestrained press can effectively expose deception in government. The swirling storm around WikiLeaks today, I think, reinforces the need to defend the right of all media, both new and old, to reveal the truth. Thank you.